So how did early Christian depictions of hell place more blame on women is a great question because it's maybe something that you might anticipate. But when I was looking at the evidence, I it was one of my first big surprises in my research that early Christians in their depictions of hell changed who is responsible for which sins based on the gender norms of their time and those gender norms shift over time. So I'm looking at depictions of hell from the second century to all the way through the 11th century CE. And that gives me, um, and they're depictions of hell that are building off of each other. So that's why I'm comparing them, but looking at their dis distinct times in which they were written. And as we look at that, big picture and start to compare across time, we see that some of the earliest depictions of um, sins that Christians would describe relating to parenthood, for example, um, including a range of different things, um, were punishing both men and women in an early period of Christian history. We see this from the Didache forward, and we see it in the Apocalypse of Peter and the Apocalypse of Paul. But as time goes on, uh, women exclusively become uh, responsible for those sins. And even more than that, in the in the early medieval texts and the later texts in the medieval period, um, women are not only responsible for keeping children alive, their own children, they're also responsible for and providing heirs for the empire. They're also responsible for sustaining other people's children. So there are early Christian hell texts, for example, some of the Ezra apocalypses that punish women for not nursing other people's newborns um, that were abandoned or exposed. Um, so um, it says that, you know, they they didn't offer their breast to the to the stranger's infant. And so they will be hung up and wild beasts will gnaw at their breasts for all of eternity. And so we have these violent punishments that um, have that Roman standard of justice that are meted out against these women. And the men who parented these children are nowhere to be found in these later texts. Um, the same thing goes for adultery. So um, there are many of the depictions of hell where men and women are punished alongside each other for um, for sexual sins, but uh, in increasingly we see women being held responsible for those for particular aspects of those things, and uh, men not as much. So um, ancient standards around women's dress, for example, uh, were not just about keeping women in line. They were also about signaling to Roman men which women were married and which ones were not because the societal standards in Rome were about legal heir production. And so women who um, were married, if, if a man had a sex with a woman who was married, he had committed adultery. If a man um, had sex with any other woman who was not married, even if he himself was married, that was not considered adultery. So women who didn't dress according to their proper social status as a married woman could confuse a man into uh, committing adultery. And so women are being held responsible for that sexual propriety in the broader society. And we see Christians mirroring this in the texts that describe how. The early Christian hell texts make disabled bodies emblematic of sin by describing bodies in ways that, um, so specifically the punishments for sins in the, the hell texts, describe the damned as inhabiting bodies that were considered, of course, the word for disability doesn't exist in the ancient world, but they're inhabiting bodies that would be considered, we would say, non-normative or, or disabled in our world. So bodies that are not the desired state that you want your body to be in. According to ancient medical authors, according to other early Christian texts that describe disability, according to New Testament gospels, right? We see this attitude toward the disabled body in a number of places in antiquity. And what happens in these early Christian hell texts is that negative, um, that negative attitude towards the disabled body is amplified because it's associated with the sinful body. Um, so um, blindness is a punishment that occurs in hell. Uh, 
the um, there are a number of punishments that render people um, unable to speak or with um, lacerated tongues and, and speech impairments for all eternity. Um, and then there are some things that we would not necessarily assume represent a disabled body in the contemporary world, but when we do more research into what life was like in antiquity, we realize that what that, that is exactly what's happening. So for example, um, all of the descriptions of hell talk about worms that, that eat at bodies. And for the first number of years that I had been thinking about these texts and working on hell, I had kind of assumed that those were earthworms, like the, because I'm thinking about dead bodies and afterlife and, and hell's under the ground. So I had always assumed it was earthworms, but in antiquity, they don't necessarily bury bodies the way that we do. And, and second of all, these are terrifying to people. And while many people think worms are gross, I don't think that they necessarily find them to be terrifying. And I couldn't figure out why worms were inciting fear in these texts. And then I started to read some of the philosophical and medical literature around um, worms in antiquity and discovered that, of course, because of sanitation practices and, um, and life in antiquity, um, roundworms and tapeworms were highly prevalent and deadly and people were terrified of um of succumbing to worms and so this was the and and there are a number of texts both christian and non-christian that describe um being consumed by worms as um as a kind of persistent fear so when the descriptions of hell describe bodies being eaten away by worms um for all of eternity or people vomiting up worms from their mouth, um, which is in some of the medical texts, a description of what would happen in cases like this. Um, they're describing bodies that are um, disabled in antiquity and a, and a threat that was persistent. While Christians are picking up on the stigma that exists around the disabled body in antiquity, and it mirrors some of the social stigma that exists around disability in our own world today, um, which is part of the real world consequences of these texts, um, it's not to say that everyone in antiquity in every situation thought that disability was a capital B, capital T bad thing, um, but that these texts amplify and pick up on some of the negative attributes of thinking about the disabled body in antiquity that happen to also have a role in our own world um, when we think about situations of ableism. So ableism is the word for, you know, any attitude toward the body that assumes that um, living in a body that the culture, the parent, the broader culture deems not normal is a terrible thing and it should be avoided at all costs. And this is a very commonly held thought in our society. We see this everywhere. I, I think that the real world implications of these hell texts is that the idea that the disabled body is emblematic of sin is broadly held. You don't have to, to spend very much time on any social media platform before you come across this idea. And it is frequently articulated without critique or comment as if this is just plainly true. Um, I, about a, a year ago, there was a woman on Twitter who said something like um, that, you know, ADHD was just poorly managed sin. Um, as a person with ADHD, I found that to be very appalling. Uh, I, she, I, I just, but, but common. I, you didn't, and she, and then the hashtag was something like think biblically as though anybody who reads a biblical text or practices Christianity would just know or understand intuitively what she was talking about without any reflection or explanation. And that this was just patently true without any, any teaching required. Um, so I, I think that one of the real world consequences is that Christian theology has for thousands of years been bound up in um, theological outlooks on the body 
that are somewhat alien to the Christian message. So one of the really stunning things about the, the early Christian hell text is that many of the sins that they uh, isolate are frequently the sins that mirror that the ethical model of the Sermon on the Mount. Care for the poor, um, care for the stranger, care for the marginalized other, visiting the sick, um, visiting the prisoner. So people who don't do those things, who don't follow the ethical model of early Christianity are punished for that in the afterlife. What's interesting is that the, the rhetorical method that they use to convey that information is really at odds with the message itself, especially from our perspective. And so we have a tension within the texts themselves between the Christian ethical message and the rhetoric that they're using to try to get it across, which is sort of antithetical to that. And I think that over time, as that tension is less and less obvious to people, when someone like Dante creates a vision and it becomes widely popular and gets read as a classic in, in much of the world, um, that, that idea of hell and those ideas of bodies from, that are from that Roman world and that are kind of at odds with the Christian message starts to become the Christian message itself for people. And, and so that's where I think part of the problem with these texts is that they have been used to prevent people from asking questions that they maybe should, right? Um, but the other thing that I think is very serious in terms of real world consequences is that many, at least in the United States, and now I'm only speaking for the United States because I don't think this is true everywhere, um, many of our systems of criminal justice are based on some of the Roman penal ideas that are a part of these texts. And that has to do with the way that these ideas of hell get associated with Christianity and then um, sort of uncritically imported to today. I think if we're honest with ourselves, we could do much, much better as a society um, than reverting to Roman standards of criminal justice, where the punishment has to somehow fit the crime in means and intensity, right? Um, and there are societies around the world that have different criminal justice systems. <laughs> so I think that in the United States, there has been an uncritical following of that model of criminal justice that we see in these texts because it, it bears the stamp of Christian. I think in order to shift some of the things that we have inherited from these texts, the way that they look at gender, the way that they look at disability, the way that they look at bodies and, and justice is to ask questions. What in this text were early Christians trying to do? And is it the most successful way to talk about the afterlife today? Or can we do better? Um, the texts that I'm talking about are highly influential. They are not in the Bible. They have a huge influence on the Christian imagination, but they are they are texts that are written by Christians from the 2nd to the 11th century CE. And Christians in those contexts were imagining afterlife spaces in the way that they thought would be persuasive to their audiences. And so I guess since those Christians have been using um, their faculties and their intellect and their um, own um, own abilities to imagine those afterlife spaces within their own culture and time and space. I see that as an invitation for us to do the same. I, it does not make sense that this tradition would suddenly stop with Dante and that we would never reimagine the afterlife after that. But that's basically what happened. Um, and so and so I think that what we need to do is in our own era, in you know in the in the century that we find ourselves in, ask what what kind of afterlife imaginations make theological sense for who we know God to be and who we know ourselves to be now today? Because that's really different from who second century Christians knew themselves to be or who fifth century Christians knew themselves to be, right? Um, there is certainly continuity 
but we also need to ask ourselves where there's discontinuity and where we need to use our theological imagination anew.